Uh, Chair, please go right ahead. Welcome to the Easton School Committee virtual meeting, Friday, May 8th, 2020. It is 3 oh, whatever it is. Seven. 3 oh, 7, thank you, PM. Uh, I'm gonna call the meeting to order, which I just did. Um, and we also um, are doing this on a Zoom meeting. And if you want to call in uh, or text in a question at the top of the page, there's a Q and A box that you can uh, type your question to for the public. And uh, here we go. Personnel changes, <clears throat> retirements, Dr. Cabral. Yes, so we once again have the bittersweet moment of having some very experienced and dedicated professionals who are who are leaving us for retirement. So we are very happy for them, but of course, very sad for us to see that experience go out the door. So we do want to, do you, have, you have their letters, correct? Yes. So we would like to please uh, read their letters. And I do know that one of them is present. Um, I can see that Mrs. Hall, Ms. Hall is here. So uh, if you want to read Ms. Hall's letter first, please. All right, I will do that. And if I can do it without crying, I'll be really good. <laughs> <laughs> Very emotional, all this technology, all this, this COVID stuff. Okay, dear Dr. Cabral, it is with mixed emotions that I inform you of my intent to retire from Easton Public Schools. My last day of service will be October 31st, 2020. To have spent my entire career with the Easton Public School as a paraprofessional and teacher has been a true honor and the greatest pleasure. It has been the ultimate joy to watch my students over the years grow from fourth graders to responsible, kind, mature adults, and some of them even into parents of students. In addition to instructing and creating a family within the classroom each year over the past three decades, I consider myself privileged to have been the president of the Eastern Educators Association for the last six years and vice president for the previous six years. The town of Easton is incredibly lucky to have so many dedicated individuals to be a part of their children's lives and education. It is a network and tribe of people that have a bond unrecognizable to other professions, relationships and a profession executed through heart and the love of teaching and the town of Easton. It is with pride that I could help guide over 350 members of our family for so many years. When Mr. Rogers said, often when you think you're at the end of something, you're at the beginning of something else. I am looking forward to my new beginnings that lie ahead. However, I will always remember my time as a professional in the Eastern Public Schools, my students, the families that welcome me and the greatest colleagues in the world. All of these individuals, <clears throat> excuse me, will be included in my future endeavors since each one is a factor in the person, the educator, and the leader I am today. Sincerely, Cindy Hall. Thank you. So, so Cindy Hall obviously has been uh, an integral part of, of the Easton Public Schools for a very long time. And um, she, uh, is fourth grade teacher at Richardson Olmsted School, has, as you noted, been um, a, a, in union leadership for 12 years. Since I've been in the district, I've, I've been working with her in that capacity. It is not an easy job for someone to, to run uh, leadership of that nature and have a full-time teaching load. Um, we all know her to be very loving of her students. And um, like I said, just uh, an incredible loss of experience and dedication to the district and to her colleagues. So uh, we'll open it up to, to comments from others uh, of the school committee. Um, I would just like to say, she is also the catalyst of Day of Kindness in honor of Devin Ness, who was her student for two years in a row. I believe it was fourth and fifth grade when she did the looping. Um, so that is a very important thing. Plus. You know, she she just has a way with her students and uh, she's just been a great teacher for all these years. Hello? 
Yes, go right yeah. ahead. <laughs> Yes, and I'll tell you, every year as people retire, certainly for me in this district, I, I think I said it earlier this year, uh, it's, it's of course going from uh, people who I know their name to I worked with them for a short amount of time to people that I, I feel like I know very, very well. And, and it's truly bittersweet, but I am uh, very happy for Cindy and for her, um, her next chapter and opportunities. Um, we wish her the best. I may, oh, go ahead, Chrissy. I just wanna say that, you know, coming into a, a, a district as someone that's new, you, <coughs> you find out quickly just how important Cindy Hall is in this community. And I thank Cindy for um, showing me the ropes of, of quite a few things and her patience and um, her compassion for teaching uh, she she really is an important part in this district and has serviced the children for many many years um, and it she, she's irreplaceable and we're really truly going to miss her and I just want to thank her for all the years and everything that she's done to make this district better. Thank you, Cindy. Jen, you had your hand up. I sure. So um, I. I didn't know Cindy as a teacher of any of my children, but um, I was one of the board members of the ROPTA for several years. And um, she really stood out as one of the teachers who, um, who who put a lot of care and attention into making things easy for us as volunteers. So that was just one of those things that really stood out to me. Just, you know, everything from getting your field trip checks that are somewhat organized and <laughs> being prompt with requests for reimbursements and always very courteous with transactions uh, and interactions with us. So it was very much appreciated from the, the PTA side of things. Good, thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna make a motion to accept with regret the resignation uh, or the retirement of Cindy Hall as of October 31st. You need a second? Second. All those in favor? Caroline. The roll call. Caroline, yes. Uh, Caroline O'Neill, yes. Durance, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Cindy, for your service. Wow, and that just made it feel real. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's happening. Congratulations, Cindy. Mm -hmm. And I want to note that she is here, and I want to thank her for being here. And I'm just sorry we aren't able to do this in person. Um, but thank her for being here. So, and Cindy, if you would like to say anything, please feel free to use the Q&A. I know you're probably yelling at me for just saying that. You don't have to say anything, uh, but all certainly in, you are welcome in. to at any point. <laughs> and, and with Cindy, you know, there's so many teachers on this retirement list so far. I mean, we have about eight and the number of years of experience and the, the just we're losing a lot this year. So as we do every year when people retire. So, okay, can I go on to the next one, Dr. Cabral? Um, Cindy, Cindy did oh. just write. She just said, thank you all with a smiley face. All right, good. And good. three exc and, and an exclamation point. Okay, <laughs> very good. That's Cindy. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, we have two paraprofessional uh, yeah. retirements. Robin Knowlton and Deborah Lucy, and I don't know that they're here because not every, there are there are some people sign in with a number, so mm -hmm. I would just say that if they are here, um, not that it makes a difference, we're still going to go on with this, but I want to recognize them if they are here, if they could just type in the Q&A that they're present, but you can um, go ahead with that. Okay. Um, dear Dr. Cabral, it is my intention to retire as a paraprofessional at the end of the 2020 school year. I have enjoyed my 18 years of employment. However, I feel that now is the time for me to move on to the next chapter of my life. It is sad for me not to be able to say goodbye to all my current and past students in person. However, <clears throat> given the current state of the pandemic, this is not possible. I look forward to this next chapter and hope to be an active member of the Eastern community. Robin Knowlton. She's a uh, fourth grade paraprofessional at RO, and uh, she's she's quite a person. <laughs> yeah, another she's hit, at, another hit at RO, 
And I yeah. first met Robin very soon after joining the district. We worked together on a on a hiring committee for an administrator and uh, she was wonderful. And then of course, uh, came to know her as a paraprofessional, paraprofessional as well. So clearly 18 dedicated years of service. Um, we are very sorry to see her go as well. Very lovely, lovely person. She is. Um, does anyone else want to make a comment? Okay. I'll make a motion to accept with regret the retirement of Robin Knowlton Para at RO. Wiseman second. All those in favor? O'Neill, yes. Durant, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Thank you. And you want me to <coughs> the last one? Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, the public information on it. Yes. yes. Okay. Dear Dr. Cabral, uh, I plan, uh, I am retiring Friday, May 20th, 2020. I would like to thank the Eastern Public Schools for the opportunity to be part of the OA community for the past 12 years. Debbie, Deborah Lucy. Uh, Deb was a para at OA. She also had worked for a bit, I believe, at the Easton Middle School. And uh, she's just a one, what a nice lady. She's just, a, she's a wonderful person. Again, a great loss to the district. And we thank her very much for her service. A very um, indelible mark on our children. Does Young adults, else, I should say. Does anyone else have any comments? All right, so I'll make a motion to accept and regret the uh, retirement of Deborah Lucy. Star second. All those in favor? O'Neill, yes. Durant, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Congratulations to all the retirees. Best wishes. Yes. Okay, COVID 19 update, Dr. Cabral. Did you skip an item? I'm sorry. No. Fee? No. Fee? I don't see fee on my thing, but that's all right. Yeah, we can go to fee. Fee is second. I don't have that. I, maybe the one I printed out is. Okay, I just didn't know so, where you were I'll on look, the board if I'll there was a change to that item. All right, let me look. Go ahead. Okay. Fee. We're going to do fee. Okay, so <clears throat> as the, the committee is aware, we've had many, many requests for devices for remote learning, which we anticipated. But it has gotten to, uh, we're over 240 requests. We are getting 10 to 12 requests a day. It would seem like it should slow down or stop at this point. Uh, however, you know, you get to different home situations. So for example, we have parents who weren't working at home, who now are working at home and perhaps need the device or the, as the units are uh, changing and morphing they need to spend a little bit more time online and it perhaps is not working well for the families so we just have this continued need that is continue that is uh, ongoing so we are still supplying those devices and as you can imagine they get a different level of oversight and use uh, in someone's home as they do when they are stored and charged and maintained in the school. So we're not really sure the condition that they're going to come back in. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get most of those back into circulation. Uh, but with that said, we are falling a little bit behind, of course, in our device acquisition. However, we are very excited to announced that once again, Fee has very generously donated $15,000 for the purchase of 60 Chromebooks and a Chromebook cart, which we are right now in, in desperate need of. So we greatly appreciate that. We are not able to have a procurement plan of our own in Easton because of the state of the budget. And so without this, we literally <coughs> would not be getting new devices to add to the fleet. What we're doing with our budget is, is maintaining what we have and keeping them updated. So this is a, a huge contribution and we are exceedingly uh, grateful for this. I can assure you they will be put to very good use. And so these will go into the buildings and then some of the devices that have been used already will be the ones that we use for loaners. They're still in perfectly fine condition. 
uh, but we're going to have the new ones be in the buildings for um, the most recent downloads and such for the teachers to make part of their uh, learning plans when we return to the building. So that is something that we wanted to certainly acknowledge and let you know about as a school committee. And it is a significant donation. And so we're asking for you to uh, vote for the acceptance of that donation. Do I have a motion? Second. No, no, I need a motion. Oh, a motion that we accept the donation of $15,000 to purchase 50 Chromebooks and a cart from Fee. Yeah. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Durance, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Thank you. Okay, that's very nice of Thank Fee. you. Yeah, thank yep, you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, COVID-19. Um, before we continue, we have a comment Go ahead. related to the retirement of the Paras yep. from Tiffany Sears wanted to say, I want to thank the Paras. It is an intense job that parents are very grateful for. Thank you, thank Tiffany. You. Thank you, Tiffany. That's a great acknowledgement. Thank you, Ms. Sears. Uh, so Christy, thank you for checking that because for some reason the Q&A won't open for me. So if you okay. could just make sure you're checking that, that would be great. Yep. All right. Thank you. Sorry, I was getting a little feedback. Uh, COVID-19 update, there are not uh, huge things. Of course, I'll have, sorry. I'll have Mrs. Pruitt do a, an academic update uh, at the end of this, but I just have a few things. First of all, we have essential staff returning to buildings uh, on, a, on a limited basis. First are some building custodians. Are you hearing that feedback as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Minimize it. We have custodians in buildings on special specialized schedules. We have some clerical staff there. They were very instrumental in helping us get out special education progress reports and report cards. So we appreciate that. We have food service, of course, doing the grab and go food preparation for uh, 60 to 70 children a day. We also have the administrators and secretarial unit members where appropriate. So these staff members are back in the buildings. We are waiting until the, the town reopens town buildings to have other people in, inside of schools. So for example, the students who have asked to pick up materials and staff members who have asked to pick up property and materials, we just need to wait until the town opens public buildings. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Also, we have uh, the nurses are going in as well to do some medication dispensation. And that email is going out to anyone that that uh, pertains to. So they will be doing that as well. And we thank them very much for their coordination of that effort. So in terms of picking up materials other than the medications, the governor, many of you may be aware that the governor's has a, a subcommittee, a repopulation or reopening subcommittee that's working uh, for a plan to repopulate and, and open businesses and, and industry in the Commonwealth. And the governor is going to be receiving their report on Monday, May 18th. That is just the receipt of the report. And then he will need to make any recommendations based on that accordingly. Because of that, we don't anticipate that he will say, I've just received the report, so now things are open today. I'm anticipating that he will, he will review that report. He will make recommendations as a result, perhaps the next day or the next week. I, I don't know, of course, what the report is going to recommend. And so uh, the, the governor will have to make a determination based on that. So it definitely will not be until after that report comes out, which is the 18th, but how far after, obviously we won't know until we see the report publicly. And then even if the governor has not yet put out his recommendation or doesn't within the day or two after that, depending on what the recommendations are, we may able, be able to make some projections based on what they, report. So for example, if they say we don't recommend anything opening until after May 30th, then at least we'll know 
we have to wait until May 30th. Mm -hmm. So that's just an example. I don't anticipate anything in particular. So we just need to wait until the 18th to provide further guidance on that, unfortunately. We are trying to work things out. If there is an emergency of any kind, we are asking people to contact individual principals, but really barring an emergency, we, we do need to wait um, just to obviously to be safe out of concern for those um, working in the buildings right now, but also for anybody that might be coming in to, to pick something up. So we will be on that as soon as possible. In terms of food donations, we, uh, I guess it's uh, good and bad news. We have uh, had donations every Monday that have been going to the food pantry. Well, and again, I, I'm going to ask, uh, excuse me, I'm going to thank Ann Weintraub for running that effort for us. It's been going very well with excellent, amazing volunteers who uh, are making quite a difference in our community. But they, the food pantry actually has asked us to halt those donations through the month of May because they're really at capacity in their facility. However, Mrs. Weintraub did make some calls and my brother's keeper is very excited to take those on. So we are, we did suspend the donations for one Monday just so that she could make those arrangements, but we are now collecting donations again. So anyone that would like to donate food, non-perishables to my brother's keeper, or ultimately it will be the food pantry again or another organization similar, we are doing that every Monday from 9 to 11 in the front of Richardson Olmstead. So you may see people in the back of Richardson Olmstead on those Mondays, but that is for the grab and go pickup. So if you are looking to donate food, it is a contactless food donation. You either, you know, you can drop off the donation on the curb and volunteers will bring it inside or you can pop open your trunk, volunteers will take it out. So there really is, you don't need to get out of your car. You don't have to worry about that. But if you're willing to donate, we do have very uh, willing recipients. So I just wanted to put that out publicly again so that people would know while we did suspend it for one Monday, we are going to be continuing that again. And then finally, the uh, remote learning update and I'll um, toss it over to Mrs. Pruitt, Assistant Superintendent for that. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Our remote learning continues. Um, as stated last week at our school committee meeting, we are shifting to focus on the power standards. This past week and the week prior, our, our curriculum leaders were intensely working with their teams to ensure that all the power standards either have been covered to satisfaction, the standards, they, they've been sorting out the standards that although they may have been covered need to be covered more or standards that haven't been covered at all. And they've been designing the remote learning plans to address the standards uh, in those areas. The, the standards that might need more attention um, specifically may require some small group work um, for particular students. So. Uh, parents might be receiving um, information from reading interventionists or other paraprofessionals to um, participate in some of that small group work, um, or they may not. It might be done by the teacher. Um, also, when we talk about the teaching of the new standards, we particularly think about um, asynchronous learning. Uh, it's very difficult, as stated before, to have an entire class on um, a, a Zoom call or a Google Meets, we act, we're actually using Google Meets to perform a lesson um, specifically due to um, you know, uh, scheduling conflicts that might be going on in a household, internet connection, but also the benefit of having asynchronous learning is that the, the students can observe a lesson over and over again. Um, and that is something that is, I think, more beneficial than, than any live teaching on a computer right now. Um, this, the, the teachers are also very available and staff members if you have questions. So I continue to encourage families to send emails to the teachers and paraprofessionals, whoever's working with your child. Um, if you have questions or concerns about what specifically your child might be doing. Um, and they're, they've, been, they've really been remarkable. Um, just this week, I've been receiving templates from some of our curriculum leaders 
on how they're sorting out the standard. I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> when they will be addressing the standards and uh, how exactly they will be teaching the standards. So they've been they've been working tirelessly, and I've heard from multiple educators just how how much time they're putting in to ensure that our students are getting the best from this experience. And I really, really commend them for that. Um, you know, as you know, this is Teacher Appreciation Week, but I feel like they should be appreciated more than just this week because they're, they're, they're rock stars. They're really doing amazing, amazing work. And I also wanna point out that our administrators are there alongside them, leading the way and doing the work with them, which has been, which has been really, really great. Um, we did have staff. a meeting with the committee. Sorry, oh, and yeah, our support absolutely. staff. It, it's oh, just, uh, we can't, I know we say this at every meeting. I'm sorry, we can't overstate it. If people are wondering what on earth could a teacher possibly be doing right now if they're not six, uh, you know, seven hours in a classroom, please trust us. We're working with them. We're in multiple, they yeah. may not meet with their class every day, but they're meeting with their department, they're meeting with their school, they're meeting with us, right. they're meeting with curriculum leaders, they're meeting with students. They're, believe me, they are. their time is well accounted for, and none of us actually could have predicted that we actually would be putting in more time every day right. in a remote learning platform. I can guarantee you that is the case. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's worried about people not perhaps being engaged as much as they typically are, we. Chrissy and I are assuring you that is the case. Yes, and we, we did meet with the commissioner this week um, just around some of, you know, he was checking in with the, with the districts on how everyone was doing. There is guidance coming out from the department on grades for high school. So once that comes out, we will look at that more intensely with our high school. Um, and they also just, just came out with some guidance for AP testing. So. I will be reviewing that with Mr. Paul and Mrs. Mancuso, our guidance department head on Monday. Um, and other than that, you know, I, again, just to reiterate, please reach out to your children's um, teachers and educators uh, if you have any questions or concerns. Um, they are definitely there to uh, to help. I just see that we have a question. Um, it says from Miss Deb. With reference to special education students correspondence not yet okay i'm not sure what that means <laughs> we can give her a minute to to maybe rephrase yep. the question yep um so i just uh yeah see i, I see question but i can't open the question so thank you for okay. that so I just wanted to point out that we have to work in compliance with DESE guidelines. And the commissioner has very clearly noted that DESE would like to see asynchronous learning for our students. So we are we, we need to be in compliance with our commissioner and DESE guidelines in Massachusetts. So if people are seeing things, again, we, we talk about comparisons. If people are seeing things in different states, it will not apply to us. Uh, private schools, it does not, we are under the same regulations. And finally, in terms of other schools in the Commonwealth, public schools in the Commonwealth, we started this whole online platform by really investigating those things and following every time somebody said, you know, so-and-so is doing this or the district district is doing that. And 100% of the time we found that it either wasn't actually happening or the uh, leadership told us that it was not working successfully in their district at that time and that they were looking to pivot themselves. So we feel very confident. We know exactly who our colleagues are in the state. We, we communicate with them every single week, frequently, multiple times a week. And so we are, we are confident that what we are doing in Easton is the right thing for our students at this time during this particular situation. Yeah, so um, Teresa Skinner is on the call and she just um, typed in. She said that this may be regarding Miss Deb's comment. This may be a reference to the special education learning plans that are being sent to parents next week. This is being used as an IEP for remote learning. So unfortunately, we're using the same term, a similar term for two different things. So when we talk about 
There's the general education remote learning plan that all the teachers are doing. And there's also a, spe a special education remote learning plan. That is an IEP. They're, they're using that as our, an IEP um, uh, for the remote learning plans. Um, this week, our teachers, our special education teachers have been focusing on putting together the progress reports to, set, to be sent out to staff. So that is, um, that is something that, that they're working, that they've been working on this week. Next week will be the special education remote learning plans, which will be a little bit more individualized. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, it's a similar term for, so it might get some parents confused. When we talk about the remote learning plan um, in this context, we, I was talking more about the general ed um, learning plan. So I hope that that does clarify for the participant. But if not, please just write in again. Right. We will address it even if we move, if, with the chair's Correct. permission, we'll address it even if we move on further in the agenda. Absolutely. Um, so uh, that's all I have right now. Um, as, as always, I welcome feedback and questions. So please feel free to reach out to me at any time regarding the remote learning plans. And that's all I have for COVID-19 update as well. Does anyone have any questions on the committee? Not right now. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks Dr. Cabral. Thanks Chrissy Pruitt. All right, a budget okay. update. So we had an executive session yesterday for three and a half scintillating hours. <laughs> I do want to just say that I very much appreciate the seriousness of purpose and the thoughtfulness that the school committee put into really crunching a lot of numbers with us and your patience in going over everything. I, I never worked with a more engaged, knowledgeable, supportive school committee. And so I wanted to make sure that despite the fact that we can't actually put out all the details of the executive session, that I, I must note the seriousness with which it was approached and I uh, feel as though I have a, a, a much clearer picture going forward through this very difficult process. I also want to thank my leadership team for their continued focus on this budget and doing it in a very quick turnaround and completely uncertain, unknown circumstances. And finally, I have to especially thank um, our director of finance, Marilyn Gordon, who she and I, uh, you know, normally we spend more time together than I do with my family, but I'm in lockdown and I am still spending more time with her than I do with my family. So I, I want to thank her for her patience. Uh, I sent her on a lot of uh, sometimes goose chases when I say, well, let's crunch this and maybe this means something. And sometimes it turns into something and sometimes it doesn't. And we don't know unless we actually do those exercises. And so I appreciate her patience. In, um, in, in helping me vet out a lot of the things that, that either come to us as suggestions or we kind of cook up on our own and trying to solve some really radical problems we have right now. In terms of a timeline going forward, I'll just repeat that the state has not yet given uh, us any direction in terms of a budget. They are actually, as a leadership, still trying to hammer out the process that they're going to use. So the typical process of governor's budget, House, Senate, ways and means back to the governor again, I don't see how that's going to work in this tight time frame. How, uh, however, we don't know what they're gonna choose to do instead, whether the governor revisits his budget, whether it goes straight to the House and Senate, whether they're gonna try to do it together, we just don't know. So because we don't even have the guidance yet on how that will happen, we certainly don't know what the result will be. Normally, we are planning a budget a year to a year and a half ahead, excuse me, of knowing. In fact, we pass the budget every year at town meeting without even having the final numbers from the state. This, however, trumps everything. We, this is clearly a, a total unknown. So we are going by some, some would say very hopeful percentages in terms of a cut in what we're going to receive from revenue from the state. We are using a, an 8% revenue cut projection. 
We, of course, along with the town administrator, the two of us have been very closely monitoring the, the federal, the state, and even the local economist projections. And they've gone, there are some towns that are, some of my colleagues are using a 10 or a 15% projection in cuts to state revenue. We had the uh, chair of the Ways and Means Committee, Mike Rodericks, who said it could even be as much as 20%. So it's, as I said in our last meeting, it's beyond a moving target. It's trying to uh, you know, follow and, and catch up to a speeding bullet at this point. None of us has ever experienced anything like it. So to say I have the answer for how to approach this would be disingenuous at best. So we, uh, Connor and Wendy at the town level, Marilyn and I were all working with an 8% cut in state revenue uh, to come up with something. And then we will obviously have to bob and weave and pivot some more if those numbers come in any worse. We don't see projections of that being a lot better. I will remind the public and uh, you know, much more intelligent fiscal financial people than I can explain this to you. You can find a lot of articles on this, but basically we're talking about the letter recoveries, whether it's going to be a V recovery and, and you know, we, we shoot right back up, which would be of course the best case scenario and perhaps better than an 8% cut. But then the other scenarios are all very concerning, whether it's a W or a U or an L and, and you certainly can look these all up, but just picturing the letters, I think you can, reasonably predict what that means in terms of a, an economic recovery. And so we just to be completely transparent, we're working with that as our guide, but fully knowing that some people are projecting a possibility of far worse. And so while in education, we have to even be more ahead of the curve uh, than maybe our, our colleagues on the town side, because we work in school years. And so we need to make decisions for, for September now. We need to let educators and uh, staff know if there are gonna be significant changes in programs. We need to let them know if there are gonna be layoffs. We need to be as prepared as possible in terms of funding. And so we're in a very difficult situation. So I do have some guidance from the school committee on the direction they'd like to pursue with regret because all of the circumstances are not good, obviously, if you're cutting that much. And so I have two, we have two dates coming up. Normally, we would have already presented to a joint committee of the select board school committee and finance committee that was actually scheduled for the last week of March and was canceled. It was the week that everything closed. So we are preparing to have that meeting um, next week. Or no, the week after, excuse me. The week Where's after, um, tentatively for May 18th at this point. Um, yeah. So that will be a joint presentation, of course, a public meeting. If anyone is interested in seeing more specifics about the economic projections that I just gave a very high level balcony view of, you can get it in a lot more detail and see where we may be going in terms of a town, what, what we're using as a town and a district as guidelines and preparing our budgets. Uh, we will not have a finished budget, I don't believe, even though town meeting is scheduled to be just a few days later on June 22nd. So with that short amount of turnaround, typically I would have already made another presentation to the school committee and, but I also, and this is extremely important to, to me personally and professionally, I would have made a special presentation to staff. I think it's very important for them to know exactly what's going on and to be very transparent with them as well. I've done that throughout my superintendency and I, it is something I wanna continue. We did have actually the Monday that we closed, we had had a staff meeting scheduled specifically for this purpose. Now that would have been a starting point but certainly that has since gone out the window, that budget has gone out the window, but at least it would have given context and they would have been up to date. So I regret that we have not been able to do that, but in an effort to keep people know, uh, keep people informed and keep, keep our, our really beloved staff informed of what's happening, 
I am scheduling a meeting with uh, union leadership to take place next Wednesday. And so I will be meeting with uh, the heads of the un units to give them an idea of what the economic outlook is and what that means for the district. I have thought about how to do this with the full staff, but the, the fact of the matter is because there is such a quick turnaround, I really would like to be able to get some feedback and input from these unit leaders at that meeting. And I think if we have 500 people on a, on a Zoom or 200 people even, that it would, I, I don't want any unit to not be able to give me some input and I want to make sure we have fair representation. And so this is the what I thought was the best way we could get this done in, in really a short amount of time. And so that's why we're setting it up this way. And hopefully it won't be the end of it. Obviously they will have the opportunity to go back to their units and, and get some feedback and, and share it. We're always interested in knowing what our staff believes uh, to be doable for us because, <coughs> because it's very important for us to uh, make sure that they are in on this process. As you know, we, we went through a very laborious process. We do that every at the beginning of the year where we really incorporate everyone and it, it does take a lot and it's a lot of effort on their part and we're so grateful for them of, for doing that, but they are there. They're, I, I never, I don't, you, you don't hear me say the front lines cause I don't, I just don't believe in the battle sort of analogy. Um, they're there in with the, first operations, the very first face with these students and with these protocols that we put in place. And so it would be, I don't even know how a leader could make decisions uh, for a district without consulting those that are going to implement them. So I'm so thankful for the feedback and input they've given to this point and want to make sure they're still in the loop. and with our limited capabilities right now, that, that's how we're gonna try to do this. So we are looking at a projected cut for us. Right now there's a town deficit. So the entire town of Easton with the projected revenues of $2.8 million. That's a huge figure for our town. Last year, just to give some context, it was 1 million and we had some, some hurtful cuts last year. And that was $1 million deficit that we had to close at the town level. This is almost three times that. So you can see that this pandemic has had a very significant impact on our operations. Um, we are looking at approximately a 5% cut in the district from the last budget that we presented to you. So that last budget had rollover of contractual obligations and it had minimal, minimal additions. One being a school adjustment counselor for TLC, uh, English language teacher, um, and uh, replacing a science teacher at the high school because of the impact that that program took from, from a cut they, they endured last year. So we need to reduced by 5% from that budget, which was uh, just over 4% in total. So based on the last presentation and anybody who would like to see that last presentation, you can see that under school committee presentations. Uh, it was at the end of February. So the, the last week of February, I think you can see that presentation in detail from that presentation, we need to make a 5% approximately 5% reduction. And so that's what we're working on right now. That's about, from that budget, it's about, it's close to a million dollars just for schools, which is, it's difficult. It's, the word devastating is the only one that I'm thinking of. I was trying to think of another one, but uh, it, it, it is devastating. We're gonna lose services, there's no question. If you're looking at our typical chart of strategic, proactive and reactive, and then regressive under that, we're off the chart. It's not even close, it's regressive. We were aggressive last year and, and we're at the same, the same point this year. We're going backwards. You can't cut a million dollars from a, a, a budget and not, and not go backwards. So it is going to be extremely difficult. We have spent the last few years making cuts already. I, we, we are hopeful most people did not see that impact because that was the whole point. Obviously those people that were affected by it, 
negatively did feel the impact. That would be, you know, our custodial unit, our unit A, our unit B, our clerical staff. We have taken hits in many areas. We did have reduction of some services. We have not resolved some outstanding issues that we have in terms of civil rights and civil rights meaning equity of access to education for our English language learners, for example. So this is this is just uh, this isn't the first time we're cutting. And if people are are unaware of what we have been doing, we um, would again recommend that you check out that presentation because it does also list some of the impact of even just last year's cuts to this school year and how that has had a negative impact on our district, our educators and our students. So we are going to, with the guidance we've received last night, we're moving forward and taking a look at some, some numbers, knowing full well that our efforts could be thwarted in the sense that we could ultimately have to reduce even more if some of those really uh, dire projections out there are uh, come to fruition. So unfortunately, we don't have control over that. We don't know when things will reopen in the state. We don't know when the economy even has the opportunity to start bouncing back. We don't know what buyer uh, response will be to facilities opening again, all of these things are clearly outside of our control. And so unfortunately, the guidance that I have been giving to the leadership team is that we have to make preparations based on the minimum facts that we do have and make adjustments to that when they come, which we know they will. So questions people have been asking, for example, about September, we have no idea, but we have to presume we're going to school in September and then change our course as more viable information becomes available. Because to make 45 different scenarios is taking a lot of time and energy from people. And like, uh, like something I mentioned in executive session last night when we were talking uh, about uh, budget things that would be uh, affected by the budget, I, I made the point that, you know, since this is an unprecedented time, we could have national guidance to move in a different direction. We may have state information that allows us to uh, relax certain restrictions that are currently in place. So just for example, if we try to make plans for a different scenario of learning and teaching next year, and then the commissioner of education says, listen, under the circumstances, time on learning can be reduced next year. That makes a big difference. And it literally takes all our planning and turns it on mm -hmm. its ear, as opposed to planning to go back normally and making adjustments when those things happen. So that's the tack we're taking at this time. And that's really the, the only update I have right now but the next two weeks are going to be a frenzy of budget work. And so we should be having some information coming out of the upcoming meetings. Alicia, we have two questions, okay. or I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, actually, three, three questions now. Uh, the first one is from Tiffany Sears. With an 8% cut, what does that equate to for a school budget loss? Is it going to be an automatic number or will there be negotiating with other committees in town after seeing state budget? So uh, I think I think I uh, covered that when I talked about maybe that was sent prior to um, finishing my it response. Was. I'm not sure yep. if it's if it's not. I can clarify uh, if there are if there's a if I don't answer that exactly. But it's about a million dollars or you know less. <coughs> if we have to do any more, I, I can't even think about that right now. So uh, up to a million dollars possibly. And 5% uh, from the budget I presented to the school committee, the 4.3, I think, increase. Um, the next question is from oh, Jane. I'm sorry, was there something about other committees in town? Uh, is it going to be an automatic number or will there be negotiating with other committees in town after seeing state budget? Uh, I So that's I think that's two different questions, if I'm hearing it correctly. I think one is... Uh, 
is that a definite number? I, I think committees might mean the different departments in town, perhaps. Like, I think that, um, Ms. Sears, I think you're referring to police, fire, DPW, et cetera. We are working in constant communication with the town. And yes, they are also doing similar exercises. And if we are able to close that gap, we will stop cutting things, absolutely. And uh, the other part of that, I think, is will there potentially be a readjustment if we get more firm numbers from the state? And that's also a yes, things that we can potentially change. There are some things that, you know, if we, for example, if we lay people off, it would be very difficult for us to change that course of action, um, especially if it's, you know, September or October of next year, which to be perfectly honest, we may not get numbers for a state budget until fall. That is, that is actually possible. What would happen, uh, we've talked about it before at some of these meetings, is we'll, we'll institute what's called a 112 budget, which means that if the state does not have a budget and we don't have a budget as a town, by July 1st, we have a 112th budget, FY20, with some marginal increases for July. And then if we don't have one by the end of the July, we have the same thing for August and perhaps September. So we uh, don't know. But if we do, the, the minute we get firmer numbers, the, the budget is always a moving target in the best of times. We are going to adjust based on what we find out from the state as well, whether we're going to be getting more than we anticipate or uh, what we don't hope would, would be less, of course. I hope that answers that question. Um, the next question is from Jane. Can you, and it, it just says Jane, so I can assume who it's from, but we can't assume, right? Don't presume. Um, <laughs> uh, it says, can you discuss a relationship between the entitlement grants and the operating budget? Sure. So we have very few entitlement grants in Easton. They are based on things like poverty rate and, uh, and um, town income and, and so forth. So we receive far less than other districts. And then within the grants, we receive far less dollar amounts than other districts. And despite that, we have we were notified of maybe two or three months ago that we would actually be receiving even less next year because some of the entitlement grants have a baseline poverty rate of 5% and the rate fluctuates every year based on the 2010 census, uh, the, the rate of poverty fluctuates. So despite the fact that we have a 16% free and reduced rate in the town of Easton uh, School Department, in terms of need, as far as the federal government, we are 4.9%. So we're just under that. And so we're gonna be, we were 5.1 this current school year. So next school year will be 4.9 based on their metricies. It's very difficult for us to reconcile. Please don't ask us to. We are just as frustrated about that. But we are losing, uh, while we are getting a couple of slight increases in some other grants, the net loss still is over $80,000 next year uh, when we total up the, the losses and the increases. So in terms of entitlement grants, we are also going backwards next year. Talk about the perfect storm. And its relationship to the operational budget is that we do have personnel that are essential personnel that are in those grants. And whenever we lose money in those grants, we try to keep personnel and grants to the bare minimum for this reason. Uh, but we have some essential personnel for our most vulnerable populations and they are in the, enti the entitlement grants. And when we have a cut like this, we need to move them into the operational budget. And so that has a direct correlation to what is available in the operational budget. So we're not adding new positions per se, but if they're in a grant and the grant is cut by any amount or a significant amount as in this case, we need to move those employees to e either cut them, which is the case sometimes, unfortunately, or move them into the operating budget. And so it does have an effect. I will put in a plug at this point for people who are uh, have not yet completed the 2020 census, because while it may seem as though it's not connected, it is intimately connected with what Easton receives in many areas of the town, not just in the school department, to complete the anonymous 
census. You can do it online. It takes about 10 minutes. Uh, you just go Google the census 2020 or go on the town of Easton website. And please, if you've done it, thank you. If you know someone that hasn't does, done it, please encourage them to. I cannot impress upon you enough how much this affects the school department in terms of funding. So it's extremely, extremely important. Um, here's another question from Jane. If entitlement grants are cut, what will that what will that further do to the operating budget? Is there any sense of what may be happening to fe federal entitlement grants? Uh, okay, Jane, uh, whichever Jane you are, clearly I think we're on the same wavelength because I, I think I just answered that. But yeah. again, if not, please ask a clarifying question and we'll get to it. Thank you. I think that's it, Chair. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, then we'll move on to the next item. Update on school activities, Dr. Cabral. Okay, so so we have a, a, a complete halt in school activities, obviously. The sports season has been canceled per MIAA. We have no outside groups using our facilities, so that's another revenue loss of um, several tens of thousands of dollars, uh, over 50 about $55,000 just for this short time period in the spring, not to mention if there is any kind of remote learning or um, any kind of modifications to building use in the fall. We have a lot of senior activities that are going on. And so I can't even list all of them here, but I, I want to assure people that I think uh, yesterday, today, the staff at the high school have been working very hard putting out our senior signs, which I'm just going to be biased again. They're awesome. I like them better than all the other signs that, <laughs> that have been put out just in terms of aesthetics, the design, the personal delivery. Uh, so I, a shout out to our, our fantastic Oliver Ames team for really, again, going above and beyond to make our seniors feel special. So with any adversity there are always some silver linings and bright spots right and we've talked about this and i won't say that everything we're doing for seniors makes up for what they're missing out on i think that's impossible to say but i think that what they are you know some of the wonderful tributes and things that are happening are certainly things that we've never had a senior class have before and so they have just this class is wonderful. They have been so grateful. They have been so classy about what is happening with them and their senior year. And I really want to credit all of them as well as the senior um, teachers and just the whole OA community as well as the greater Easton public school community because one of the things, for example, if you are not on Twitter, anyone who's not on Twitter, uh, it's super easy to get on Twitter. I encourage you to, you know, ask your third grader how to do it. <laughs> to help you. Uh, it is a great way to see a lot of the tributes and activities that are happening because many of our administrators, almost all of our administrators, and many, many of our student groups are on there. And, you know, you can do Instagram too, of course, you know, you can do Snapchat, but for a, a particular age group, shall I say, uh, I think that a lot of adults have told me that they find Twitter to be a very easy platform for them to pop, to, to follow and even add to. And so I would just throw out a, a you know, a, 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 a excuse me, a, um, ah, lost the word, uh, a plug <laughs> for those social platforms, excuse me. So I would, I would throw out a plug to those social platforms. They tend to be uh, a lot more encouraging than maybe some other platforms can be. And so uh, I would, and, and you know, they have great pictures and I really would encourage people to jump on there. And you can, you know, link them all together and post for one and show on all and all of that stuff. But if you just wanna get to a real quick, easy spot, I, I would recommend Twitter. Uh, if you want to link to some of these, you certainly could go on mine at Soup Easton, S-U-P 
Easton and Chrissy is assist soup Easton. Uh, not that we have the best account. We're very I creative. Mean, I, I, all I mean by that is if you're looking for maybe some one-stop shopping, I follow most of the groups. And so if you just look at who the two of us follow, you can uh, link on to many of those groups. That's all I mean by that. So uh, I wouldn't say I'm the, the, the you know prolific tweeter, but we do try. So I would encourage that. But activities in general are canceled, but I did want to throw out that every single school is doing some very awesome things, reaching out, doing contests, doing uh, uh, challenges with one another, some really, really creative things. And so that's just a great platform to, to kind of keep track of them, especially if you're in one school and you want to see what the other schools are doing. But I did ask for, uh, you know, just a, like a collection, a list from the high school of all the things they're doing for seniors. And it's, it's just a huge list of things. So please be assured that we're just trying our very, very best to salvage as much of their experience as possible and make it special for them. And I would contend that there are a lot of special parts to this senior year experience. And so uh, that's, unless you have questions about student activities, that's pretty much um, what I wanted to sum up for you at this point. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you, Dr. Cabral. Next up, vote to appoint Dr. Cabral to the Bi-County Board of Directors for 2020-2021. Dr. Cabral. Thanks, so Bi-Co Bi is the, by County Collaborative. It is a special education collaborative that we partner with. I am on the board of directors as were my predecessors in Easton as, as member districts. We are one of uh, 19 member districts. As such, we receive membership rates on students that attend by County Collaborative programming. We do have many students that do. Over 75% of the referrals to by county collaborative this past year were social emotional behavioral and I'm talking about in general from the from the collaboratives perspective not Easton's referrals to by county so you can see the integral role that they play in some very important programming. We as a member we have priority in terms of placement in some of the programs that are really very well populated. Of course, we get the member rate that I explained and we get a seat at the table in terms of determining things like the professional development that the educators receive, the staffing. We recently just approved unanimously the hiring of a new executive director. I, Arlene Gruber retired after a very successful tenure as the executive director and Jean Sullivan is now the new executive director. We literally attended um, Arlene Grubert's last meeting this week and uh, con congratulated her in her retirement. We do not have a membership fee per se for, for the collaborative. The way that the structure works for this collaborative is that after four years, uh, which we have been a part of by county for, for much more than four years, there is not a membership rate. Uh, it's just the first four years of membership. So we are obviously beyond that. So at this point, obviously, other than the liability with being a member district in terms of, you know, OPED liability or what have you, this is a win-win for us. We would recommend continuing as a member. And also, I would recommend continuing having a representative at the board table in your superintendent. And so I would recommend that you um, do approve this vote. We do this annually, and this is the annual vote to continue that role. Thank you. Does anyone have any comment or questions? All right. Do I have a motion? Star, second the motion. Okay, and um, all those in favor? O'Neill, yes. Can you say Durant, that? yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. yes. Star, yes. Thank you very much. And that's a very good uh, group. 
Okay, number seven, the 2020 2021 schedule of school committee meetings, first reading. Does anyone have any, after looking through it, does anyone have any uh, comments or changes that need to be made? So I have one. I found out about it today. I think I'm on vacation December 10th, like on the other side of the country, maybe. So yeah. could we change December 10th to the 3rd or the 17th? Can't we all come with you, Nancy? Yes. And have can. it there? <laughs> yes. Come, 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 come. Yes. Come together. Yes. <coughs> yeah, I would say maybe the third, I think, would be a yeah, little I, less close to the hectic see, holidays. Yes, exactly. Although, let me check the, the third. when Hanukkah falls. Um, hold on a second. Uh, no, there's nothing on the second or the third, so. Okay, yeah, Hanukkah I, actually would have, Hanukkah starts December 10th, so it's probably oh, good okay. to move it anyway. Oh, good, okay. Um, I know, now will we do a second reading on this? It's just first reading. Or right, you'll do, a, you'll do a second reading and vote on it at the next meeting. Okay, so that that's my only change that I have. That I know of. Anyone else? Okay, and hopefully our meetings will be back in Simmons Lecture Hall and with people. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So we'll put that on the uh, next agenda for a vote and a second second reading and a vote. All right, public comment. Chrissy, do we have anything else coming in? No, we do not. Thank you. Superintendent notes, Dr. Cabral. Okay, I just want to note for the, the 17 attendees that are here, if you do have a, a question, I, I'm sure that under the circumstances, the chair, I, I have a couple of superintendent notes. If you just wanted to take a second to type it in there because you know it's a lot different than just kind of putting your hand up easily. We don't want to cut you off if you have any questions. So if there is something you'd like to add after superintendent notes, we can uh, just double check that. And yep. uh, so I don't yep. want you to think now that I'm giving my notes, your opportunity is gone. Okay, so just a couple of things. We are, despite the budget issues we have, I just wanted to make sure people knew we are going to be putting out some postings, but I want to assure people that those are only because of programs where students are moving and we don't have a program for the student. For example, the Therapeutic Learning Center at, at Richardson Olmstead, as an example. Uh, we, these are in the budget and these are not new positions. They're positions that are in the budget that we've determined cannot uh, go unfilled. So either we had someone retire from the position, someone left the position, uh, there was a substitute in the position because somebody left partway through the year, something like that. So we, uh, I just wanted to make sure we made a note of that because it may look very contradictory to what we're saying. And certainly if we're going to have any sort of layoffs of staff members, why would we be hiring people? But um, this is, these are positions <laughs> that again, we've gone through that have been vacated, that were already in the budget rollover that we have determined are essential. They are uh, almost all related to special education. And so um, that's why um, they would be posted. And there are actually the, the athletic director forwarded a couple of coaching positions even. And again, we may not even have sports in the fall. We don't know. So these are things that are sort of anticipated and may not even come to fruition, but we do have to uh, get them out there in a timely manner. This is the season for that regardless. So I wanted to make sure people were aware of that. I also wanted to let, <clears throat> excuse me, the committee know and the public know that uh, we have been, now that we've gotten remote learning up and running and we're making some really significant pivots and the staff, again, sorry, have to say it every time, it's just been phenomenal with it. We want to make sure that we always are taking a, a, the next step. And so the next step 
for us has been getting some input from parents. What has been the impact on them with remote learning? Do they have recommendations, suggestions for us? Uh, is there anything we can do to help them and their students uh, access and be part of remote learning? So many, so, some parents will have already seen those. Some parents will be getting them very soon. Again, that is not to, we're not looking to, you know, get anyone in trouble or out anybody, nothing like that. We're not looking to, you know, ha go after a principal for something not happening. That's not the case. This is strictly to help parents and students access the wonderful work that has be is being done at the school level and how we can help them. And again, uh, in line with my prior comments, we can't do any of this without getting feedback from staff. And so we've we've sort of been hesitating with that only because they're doing so much, frankly, and we don't, you know, we don't want to have like one more thing for them to do. But I have been getting feedback that staff would like to have some input. And so I, I also, as much as I don't want to give them one scrap of anything else to have to complete, it is optional, of course. And so people can make an individual decision if they want to, but I don't want to not give the opportunity to people that do want to give us some feedback. So we want to make sure that the educator experience with remote learning is also supported, of course. And so we are going to, we have some, uh, I don't think any have actually gone out yet, Chrissy, but they're being crafted right now. And yes. we have those, okay, so we have those going out. So Clearly they're not mandatory, but we want to make sure our staff has a voice, a direct voice to please let us know how their experience has been going, what we can do to help them, what supports we might be able to provide. And so we will have uh, surveyed all staff, all families, and hopefully be able to incorporate the feedback into what we're providing in terms of supports in accessing this uh, remote learning platform. So um, that is in progress slash uh, continuing to happen or, or going to be happening in terms of the staff feedback. And then finally, the Boston School Committee had, I, I forwarded through email, not for comment, just for information, a resolution from the Boston School Committee in terms of funding for next year. And what uh, we have done is uh, adapted that for Easton's information. So I uh, really, the point of information for us, I just wanted to know if you would like that on the next agenda for your discussion and or consideration, if that was something that you may want to also forward to uh, our legislature for their consideration in the FY21 budget uh, development. I would be interested in seeing that. Agree. Agree. Okay, so uh, Lynn, if you could please add that to the next agenda and we will, I'll forward that to you just for, so, so you can, um, you know, prior reading on that, obviously no discussion until we meet, but I'll, I'll forward the draft um, to you for you to formulate any questions or um, if there's any information you want us to collect in relation to it before the next meeting, we can do that as well. Okay. And that's all I have right now. Thank you. Assistant Superintendent notes, Chrissy. I just wanna take the opportunity to uh, say happy teacher appreciation week to all of our educators. I know in Easton, we don't only recognize the teachers, but we recognize all of our educators, paraprofessionals, um, everyone. So we just wanna, I just wanna say thank you for all that you've been doing to support our students. You are absolutely remarkable, and I am blessed and honored to work alongside you. So thank you very much. Thank you. And School I just, oh. uh, sorry, because she said that, I just need to add the uh, deep regret we have in um, postponing, not canceling, postponing our parade. There was such uh, an overwhelming response that it became apparent it might be difficult, even on the expansive uh, square footage of our campus, our main campus, that it might be difficult even when people are trying to employ social distancing, that people may be getting out of their cars and not have enough room to, to space out. And so um, with the input from the leadership of the town, we uh, have postponed that. I assure you it is not canceled. I assure you it is something we are very excited about doing. And now uh, 
more so more than ever now that we know how many families and children were so very excited about showing their appreciation for our wonderful educators. We will absolutely have something and it will be better than anything we could have even imagined. And we imagined some pretty cool stuff for this parade. I'm gonna just throw that out there. So we will, uh, we will make sure that it, it is definitely better than that and uh, that they will be acknowledged. Perhaps not during Teacher Appreciation Week, but you know what? They should be appreciated year round. So it might yes, be an acknowledgement uh, and there's not a teacher appreciation week, so to speak, or educator appreciation week. So we will definitely do that. We appreciate the feedback that we received and we assure you, you will be hearing from us again about that in the future. And um, the other thing I just wanted to say was happy Mother's Day to all of the Easton moms and our, our staff moms out there as well. And all of our teachers, because even if you aren't a mom, you are a mom, <laughs> as you are a mom to all those kids in the class. So happy Mother's Day. Okay, um, thank we you. Do have a, we do have a question from on here. I don't know if you want to do it now or, or wait. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, so the question is from Tiffany Sears. Do we know when next year class placement might happen? Yes. Uh, so they're working on that right now, actually. Uh, yeah. Each school, of course, is a little bit different, um, how they choose courses for the high school, the middle school, and then how the teachers are doing placement pre-K through six. But those schools are all working on that right now. The staff is working on it, and they will announce their timeline when they have that firmed up, and they will announce what the placements are when they have those ready. But please be assured that those are in progress. Yeah, and I also just want to add that um, they – because of the current situation, it may take a little bit longer than what we're used to. So if everyone could please have patience with that, that would be greatly appreciated. Yes, but we can tell you that they are putting just as much thought and consideration into it as ever before. Um, they are sharing information. They're having virtual meetings. They're um, sharing data with one another. So right. it is going to be as thoughtful as or and as in-depth as it always has been with a literally consider each student individually so the, each child will get that same level of attention um, so again all of these little not little things but all of these things in addition to remote learning that our educators are working on um, they're really having to reinvent how they're doing everything that is uh, behind the scenes that is beyond above and beyond classroom instruction and so uh, thank you for asking that because that's not something you would see, but I am, um, I can assure you they are actively involved in that right now. I am seeing those emails and meetings and, and uh, data being shared. So that, that is something they're working on. Okay, thank you. School committee notes, Caroline. Okay, am I, can you hear me okay? Yes. It's actually at this point, it's a state level conversation. So it really it's something that affects all of us. So we're brainstorming as uh, as a as a as a Commonwealth department as opposed to Easton. So again, that's an area where it's going to depend. You know, our kids even back in school, if if they are, are there split schedules? Uh, is the commissioner going to relax certain guidelines? 
So we can't actually make any decisions about that yet, but yes, absolutely. We're, <laughs> we're in the uh, information collecting stage right now and we're doing like you, uh, reading articles, research, brainstorming with other superintendents. It is something that may look different uh, across the state because as we know, there are some densely populated areas out west, we have some districts that are quite far apart, uh, I, uh, schools that are quite far apart within districts mm -hmm. and you know, Easton falls somewhere in between. So we, uh, I would caution people about you know, any particular department or state for that matter, coming up with solutions because they may, may or may not apply to our situation. But yes, of course, we're talking about not only disinfection, we're talking about Food. We're talking about activities. We're talking about staff. We're talking about transportation. There's a litany of things that are all up in the air right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Caroline, anything else? Okay, Michelle. Um, I actually just have two shout outs to pass along. I've been asked to pass along. I've heard a lot of um, positive feedback and kudos and appreciation to how well um, distant learning is going in our district and how engaged and how um, professional all the educators are being and taking it seriously and really engaging the students. And um, parents and students are very appreciative of that. So I've been asked to pass that along. And also from senior parents, um, how, much they appreciate everything that Mr. Paul has done, administration, student council, to make any, um, a schedule and try to reschedule everything and, and making a, a sincere effort to try to make all these things happen. And there's been just a lot of appreciation from parents um, about that, that I was asked to pass along. Great, that's wonderful feedback, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, first of all, Michelle, uh, you're a distant learning teacher and a mom and a mom of a senior, so kudos. <laughs> to you. Um, the trifecta. Um, also, uh, just another millionth reminder please fill out the census. Um, also, stay safe. This is not over. I, I hope people don't let down and then. You got to keep the mask and the washing hands and keep your hands away from your face and things like that. And also along with Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, the moms and dads that are being teachers at home, congratulations to you too, because uh, <laughs> it's amazing what is going on nowadays. I also want to thank Lynn Souza, uh, you know, last night and today taking notes for us and also Joe from ECAT for um, doing these things for us. And uh, you know what, this is a struggle right now, the budget, I, I wish we had millions and millions of dollars, but we don't. So hopefully we can make the best decision for our <laughs> students, our children, our teachers, everybody in the town of Easton. And uh, I, I think everybody should feel confident that, that we're gonna do the best that we can. Um, Jackie, no, uh, yeah. Jackie. Uh Okay, so, so uh, Mass Association of School Committees shared today that, there's, that the Education Committee is holding a hearing on remote learning next Wednesday, May 13th at 11 a.m. and access will be via malegislature.gov. So if anyone's interested in listening to that, just wanted to let you know. That's it. Thank you. And Jen. we go, unmuted. Um, sure, so just a couple of quick updates. Um, thank you for the CPAC town hall that was last Tuesday and uh, Leisha and, uh, and Dr. Cabral and, and Ms. Pruitt and Ms. Skinner, um, great job presenting there. I think it was well received. So um, good information again. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Jackie and I both uh, attended some meetings this week, one with the Mass Association School Committee um, round table, we had the opportunity to talk to our peers and other communities and just get a you know, sense for what they're going through. So, um, you know, it's, it's tough. It's one of those things where we're all in this together, but after talking to other districts, it's reassuring to know that I think uh, in, some, in some aspects where we're a little bit ahead of the game and in a good place um, in my breakout room, I think we were the 
one of two districts that had a plan for graduation, for example, and the rest were still sorting that out. Um, and then uh, Jackie and I were also on a call with Senator Markey um, and the, the, the Mass Association of School Committees um, this week as well. So that was inform, you know, not, not necessarily new information, um, but <laughs> it was good to hear his priorities um, and that, you know, they're, they're fighting for education in Washington. Um, let's see, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Leisha and Marilyn for all of the work you did on pulling together all the information for yesterday's session on the budget. Um, we asked you for a ton of information and you came through with everything that we asked for and then some. Mm -hmm. So um, I appreciate you giving us some really substantive information to work with. Um, two more things quick. Uh, one is, is the senior signs. I have a friend who's uh, an overnight nurse in a COVID unit, um, who's the parent of a senior. And so she's been really, you know, head down, not focused on what's going on. And she left for her shift last night and you know found the, the sign on her lawn she said it made her cry so <laughs> she put a shout out on facebook and wanted to thank whoever was involved in making that happen very appreciative and then there are some signs folks in the community may have ordered um, that were also sort of coordinated by the school as a fundraiser those came in actually while we've been here um, the lacrosse boosters dropped a bunch in in my porch that we'll be installing uh, tomorrow. So those that's happening. If you haven't gotten yours yet, it's on its way out. And then um, I really look forward to the rescheduled teacher appreciation event. You might be able to see the poster paint and uh, supplies, yeah. craft supplies mm -hmm. on the table behind me. So we were uh, looking forward to decorating and uh, honoring teachers and just wanna say again to all the educators, thank you so much for everything that you do. And we look forward to being able to show you that um, in the future. Okay, thank you. We have, right. a, we have a comment. Okay, go ahead. It's from an anonymous attendee. It says, I just wanted, I just wanted to thank Jen Starr for making masks. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Jen. All right. You're very uh, welcome to whoever that was. <laughs> go ahead, Caroline. Oh, okay. I just want to mention to Dr. Cabal that I think you're going to get a huge number of retirement letters from the parent teachers <laughs> <laughs> based on some rather comical comments I've seen on Facebook. Fr <laughs> Frankly, I look forward to letting them all go. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And then um, we do have a, a, we did schedule an executive session, but we are not going to do that. So that actually has been rescheduled for May 14th. Do we have to vote to take it off the agenda? No, we can just table no. it, right? Yes. Okay, all right, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Second. Okay, so Michelle uh, made the motion and Jackie seconded. All those in favor? <laughs> Durant's yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Okay, thanks everybody and happy Mother's Day and, and Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank and you. Let's very get much. a Chromebook to Caroline. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the works already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> happy you. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Happy and, Mother's Day. And thanks, thanks to all the participants who were here. Yes. Really appreciate that and your questions and comments. Thank you.